Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on aging and Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Shacoin, and I'm the project manager for research and education at the Advocate Medical Group Adult Down Syndrome Center. I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items and then tell you a little bit about our center before turning it over to our presenters. Next slide, please. So we are recording today's webinar and we will be sharing it on our Facebook page as well as in our resource library within two weeks of this presentation. In addition, for those who registered for the webinar, we will be sending out the link to the recording um, via email. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a Q&A button and we invite you to put in your questions throughout the presentation. There will be time at the end for us to answer answer questions. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, this webinar is for educational purposes only and is not meant to be medical advice. We encourage you to bring any specific questions to your or your loved one's healthcare provider. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, we are from the Adult Down Syndrome Center and we are a healthcare clinic located in Park Ridge, Illinois which is a suburb of Chicago. We're on the campus of Advocate Lutheran General Hospital. We opened in 1992, and since then, our providers have seen over 6,000 adolescents and adults with Down syndrome. Next slide. So in addition to providing patient care, uh, prior to COVID-19, we offered a variety of groups, and these included Zumba, Art Club, Nature Club, music group, and social skills classes. And we've continued to offer some of those classes virtually via, through Zoom. Next slide. One of our other efforts outside of medical care is our online resource library. And this is a free website that contains videos and articles and booklets on a variety of topics. And we are um, continually updating that site. Next slide. In order to access it, you can go to the link that's up at the top there, um, adscresources.advocatehealth.com, and you'll be taken to our landing page here. And you can click on one of those three audiences to find resources specific to that group. And so um, once you click on one of those, on the next slide here, you'll see that you're brought to a page with resources. And you can scroll to that narrow results section on the left side and select a topic. So you could find resources specific to aging and Alzheimer's disease, which we'll be talking about today. Next slide, please. Our presenters today are Brian Chicoin, who is the medical director of our center, and Katie Frank, who is an occupational therapist and she works at our center. I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Chicoin and he's going to share information about aging and Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, so today we want to want to obviously focus on aging and Alzheimer's disease, and we're going to uh, start with describing healthy aging and the challenges associated with aging. And we're going to provide an overview of Alzheimer's disease and then discuss management of uh, aging issues and Alzheimer's disease. And then we're going to share some lessons learned from families and caregivers. And then we're going to describe some resources to learn more and, uh, and how to get support. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with aging. So um, if you look at the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome, um, when my great uncle Leo was born in 1907 uh, with Down syndrome, although that's not what they called it at the time, his life expectancy was only nine. Uh, when I graduated from medical school in 1984, the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome was still only 28. And then today it's, it's up to 60. And, and so we can see there's a very significant increase in life expectancy, uh, even, even in the last uh, couple generations. Next slide. And so um, one of the things we wanna focus on is healthy aging. Uh, we wanna look at how can we help people age uh, in a more healthy fashion and then what, what, what do they need to do uh, to do so? So, um, and so these are things really that are important throughout life. 
Uh, but the, some of the way you approach this may change as uh, people get older. So certainly eating healthy food, uh, getting a good night's sleep uh, is so important uh, for uh, restoration of our brains uh, to be active. And that may look, particularly being active may look different for a person with uh, Down syndrome who is 20 compared to someone who is 60. Uh, but we want to encourage people to be active nevertheless. So it may, it, it, for our 50, 40, 50, 60 year olds, it may, longer, may no longer be team sports, but there are still certainly ways to be active with uh, walking and, and um, uh, you know, biking and, and uh, lots of other activities that uh, you can do. Uh, but again, maybe different than when you were, when you were younger. And then uh, certainly uh, good hydration is, is, a, is a very important factor in, in keeping healthy. And, and then also uh, taking time to relax and, and feel uh, uh, you reduce your stress. And we have lots of information on our, on our resource library that Laura indicated before uh, for both individuals with Down syndrome and their families on, on all these uh, topics uh, and encourage you to take a look at those. Next slide, please. One of the other things certainly to keep healthy is to how can we screen for uh, certain health conditions that might uh, uh, occur. And there are certainly some co-occurring health conditions that are more common in people with Down syndrome, uh, some that are the same frequency, and then some that are less common. Um, recently, the uh, Global Medical Guidelines were published uh, just uh, list this last month, um, and uh, we were part of that project. And, and there's a, this is just a, a picture of the, uh, the grid for uh, screening that is recommended. Uh, but you can see the uh, whole article and, and also the whole guidelines at the Global Down Syndrome uh, webpage there that's indicated below. Uh, and certainly we have it on our uh, link on our webpage as well on our resource library. So free, feel free to look at that as well. Um, but so there's a number of uh, screening things that are recommended. Uh, we won't go into uh, great detail about that at the moment because that's uh, gave a presentation all on its in itself the other day on this, this very topic. Um, but there's quite a few uh, things on the, in the uh, guidelines to, to take a look at. And then the, one of the questions is because some of the conditions are more common, uh, you know, do, should we be screening for those a little differently? And, and the answer is often yes. And then there are some things that are less common and should we be screening for those differently? Uh, and some of those we're still sorting out and, and uh, this healthcare, uh, health, healthcare guidelines project uh, did not answer all the questions. Uh, and so there will be uh, further questions being answered uh, over time, but quite a few questions. I do encourage you to take a look at the guidelines if you haven't, haven't seen them. A lot of lots of good information there on uh, helping people uh, be healthy and, and age uh, more healthy as well. Next slide. So some of the uh, things to consider when looking at uh, aging and people with Down syndrome. One is issues of early aging. Uh, we don't we do know that uh, people with Down syndrome do seem to age uh, uh, more rapidly at a, at a younger age, um, and uh, even with regards to a uh, recent study that uh, was uh, put online that. Uh, we were part of an international study on COVID, for example, uh, 40 was older for as far as being a higher risk for COVID compared to 60 or 65 and other people. So that's just one example of uh, uh, what we could be considered earlier aging in people with Down syndrome. Then we do see the onset of certain health conditions uh, at a younger age as well. So things like cataracts, osteoarthritis, hearing impairment, and uh, Alzheimer's disease all unfortunately seem to occur at a younger age and people with Down syndrome than those without. Now, next slide. So let's, let's focus a little bit on Alzheimer's disease. It's uh, certainly a, a, a topic that gets a lot of attention in the, in the Down syndrome community. So what is Alzheimer's disease? We know it's a progressive neurological condition that affects the brain. It's a type of dementia. So, uh, you know, dementia is sort of a, a broad term and there's lots of types of dementia. There's types of dementia you can get from having multiple strokes. There's types of dementia uh, you can get from having deficiencies of certain vitamins. There's types of dementia you can get um, from uh, for lots of reasons. And one of them is Alzheimer's disease. So that's one type of dementia. So you might call Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's disease or dementia of the Alzheimer's type uh, would, you know, might be another way that people phrase, phrase that. Uh, but dementia is the overriding category and Alzheimer's disease is one of the, one of the uh, underlying the groups or one of the causes of dementia. And in Alzheimer's disease, we tend to see in the, in the brains microscopically what are called plaques and tangles. And so these are the changes of the brains that we see in people with Alzheimer's disease, whether they have Down syndrome or not. And they're also referred to as the neuropathologic changes. Next slide. 
And we know that uh, unfortunately, nearly all people with Down syndrome uh, by the age of 40 have these plaques and tangles, have these neuro neuropathological changes. And all people over the, with Down syndrome over the age of 60 have them. Uh, so everyone with Down syndrome is getting these, these microscopic changes. Next slide. But despite the fact that everyone does get these mic uh, microscopic neuropathic changes, not everyone gets symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that is a great question for why that is. We don't really have that answer yet, uh, unfortunately, uh, but that will be uh, hopefully one of the things that will be unlocked and, and really help us with regards to understanding Alzheimer's disease uh, better. Next slide. So why is Alzheimer's disease more common in people with Down syndrome? So one of the genes associated with that Alzheimer's disease is on the 21st chromosome, and, and that's called the amyloid precursor protein, or APP. And we know that people with Down syndrome have an extra 21st chromosome, and that therefore they have an additional, what's called a gene load or a gene expression of, of, that, of that APP gene. And so because of that uh, increased uh, expression of that gene, uh, it is thought to be a major factor in people with Down syndrome uh, having Alzheimer's disease more, more uh, regularly or more frequently. Uh, next slide. So what is the incidence of clinical Alzheimer's disease? So we talked that essentially everyone with Down syndrome ultimately is going to get the plaques and tangles, but what about how many people actually come, come up with the disease or actually develop the disease? So it's thought to be pretty uncommon before age 40. Um, and that's an important factor with regards to, um, you know, if someone with Down syndrome, uh, younger than 40 presents with a decline. Uh, and and what, what, is, what does that mean? Is that, is that likely to be Alzheimer's disease? Likely to be something else. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Uh, between age 50 and 59, it's thought to be as high as 55%. And then as you get up over 60, it's thought to be as, as high as 75% or greater uh, in, in people with uh, developing uh, Alzheimer's disease who have Down syndrome. Next slide. So what are the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? Um, similar to the other, other individuals without Down syndrome who develop Alzheimer's disease, we see memory deterioration. We see loss of previously mastered skills. And this is a real important point of the, the loss of previously mastered skills. Uh, one of the challenges in, in the diagnosing Alzheimer's disease from a neuropsychological testing, for example, is that if a person um, doesn't have a skill, it could be interpreted as being Alzheimer's disease. Um, but if the person never had that skill, that, that's uh, important to note. And, and so uh, if the person is losing skills that they have, uh, that's important to note. If they never had the skill, you certainly could not count that as having Alzheimer's disease if they never had that skill uh, throughout their life. Um, incontinence is uh, a significant symptom of Alzheimer's disease as it progresses, an unsteady gait, uh, swallowing issues, dysphagia, um, and un unfortunately, uh, swallowing issues are often um, sort of the end of life event. As, uh, as the swallowing continues to deteriorate, people tend to get recurrent aspiration pneumonias, and that is, is uh, at least in our practice, the most frequent cause of death in our patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, seizures that are a significantly higher rate. Uh, so in, in people with Down syndrome, with, with Alzheimer's disease, it may be as high as 77% or so. Uh, in people without Down syndrome who develop Alzheimer's disease, uh, it's as low as two to 25%. Uh, and often um, it's earlier in the, in the process of the disease in people with Down syndrome who develop Alzheimer's disease than in others who develop Alzheimer's disease. So not only a higher rate, but also tends to be earlier on in the disease. Um, in fact, some of our patients, the first symptom of Alzheimer's disease was the onset of seizures. There was no other obvious symptoms until they developed those seizures. Now, that's not common, but, but we have seen it on uh, several occasions. Uh, weight loss is a common symptom. Interestingly, a lot of our folks uh, will actually gain weight uh, in the early on in the Alzheimer's disease. Um, they become less active, but they're still eating. Uh, ultimately, people will not eat as well typically and will start to lose weight. Um, and there may be other factors with weight loss that we don't really understand about Alzheimer's disease yet that may also uh, contribute to weight loss. And then psychological changes are very common in people with Down syndrome who develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, some some uh, providers or researchers have uh, indicated that all people with Down syndrome uh, present with psychological changes first. Uh, our sense is that it's not all people with Down syndrome. We do note that it's pretty frequent. Uh, we do see other 
uh, symptoms sometimes is the beginning on you know the beginning of the of the disease as I, as I mentioned seizures a moment ago um, but psychological changes are, are pretty common and, and often the first uh, symptoms and um, and uh, can be a challenging component of uh, treating or addressing Alzheimer's disease uh, in, in, in uh, folks with Down syndrome so psych psychological change is a very significant uh, piece of uh, uh, of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. I should note that uh, when, when we looked at a, a study several years ago and looked at um, the age of onset in our practice, um, we, I suspect we need to go back and look at that again because uh, I suspect that there probably were some psychological changes that uh, were, um, because that was the only symptom, uh, perhaps we weren't uh, diagnosing them with Alzheimer's disease at that point, but in retrospect, that may well have been the onset of Alzheimer's disease symptoms in, in those individuals. Um, so again, something to, to certainly consider in, in older folks as they develop Alzheimer's disease. But we do want to be careful um, not to attribute all of this to Alzheimer's disease and make sure that we are addressing psychological issues or any of these other issues if, if there are other reasons for that. Uh, next slide. And what are some of those other reasons? So again, when you're making the diagnosis, you want to look for a pattern of decline. So you want to, uh, some of those symptoms we just outlined. But you also have to rule out other causes. So there's, so I mentioned earlier, dementia is is the overriding um, category, if you will, and Alzheimer's disease is one of the categories. But people can, particularly older folks, can present with a dementia that's uh, caused by lots of reasons: vitamin B12 deficiency, depression, sleep apnea, hypothyroidism, even cataracts can make people look uh, as if they have a dementia. And so all of these things are important in our older. Yeah, and, and many others. Um, this is just a, a, a brief list, but you want to look at all these things. Is there something that else that is causing the decline uh, that is potentially reversible? So giving someone B12 deficiency, treating their depression, treating their sleep apnea, treating their hypothyroidism, uh, having them get surgery for cataracts, all those things are potential things that we can uh, correct and, and help the person function better. In addition, um, there are uh, certainly a lot of these things do occur as we get older and, and as people with Down syndrome get older. And, and so uh, they may also, may also coexist with Alzheimer's disease. So if the person has depression and Alzheimer's disease, uh, certainly treat, treating the depression uh, can probably help them function better. Uh, it doesn't treat the Alzheimer's disease specifically. Uh, so that unfortunately uh, goes, you know, goes on its way. But treating the depression helps them function better and feel better at least for a period of time. And then the last example on the list there is, is regression syndrome. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna talk more about that in just a second, uh, uh, but it is an important uh, thing to consider, particularly in younger people uh, with Down syndrome who have a, a change in their skills. Uh, next slide. So this I'm gonna briefly uh, talk about regression. We actually had a, did a webinar in February on regression and loss of skills. And that is on our, our, in our resource library on our webpage. And I encourage you to take a look at that if you have more questions about that. But just briefly, uh, regression syndrome uh, and Alzheimer's disease both can present with a decline in skills. Um, uh, but the people with regression tend to be younger in their teens or early 20s, and it's sometimes reversible. Where Alzheimer's disease is more typically greater than 40, and, and unfortunately, as of 2020, it is not reversible to the best of our knowledge. Um, so uh, I should add that regression syndrome is, is just what we're calling this condition. There is not an official name. Um, and, and you could, if you take a look at that webinar, there's lots more information about uh, the work of the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group and, and how we've tried to define this uh, in the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group. Um, but, it, but again, there's not a, not a formal, formal name for this. In fact, there's several names that are being uh, batted around to see which, which may be the most appropriate, but we call it regression syndrome uh, in our clinic. So again, regression syndrome is, is something that we see in much younger people than Alzheimer's disease. And, and it, it is really amazing how many times we've been contacted uh, from not only our own patients uh, uh, or from people you know, all over the country, all over the world, who said, you know, my, my 15 year old, my 20 year old uh, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I just, you know, caution that, uh, you know, we want to, you know, definitely have to take a look uh, at a 15 or 20 year old to see what else might be causing the problem, including regression. And, uh, and again, it, it would be uh, quite uncommon for somebody with Down syndrome to develop Alzheimer's disease at that young age. 
I'm not aware of anyone that ever has. Uh, I will not say it's impossible, but I would I would say that it's it's highly unlikely. So you do want to consider these other possibilities, uh, particularly in younger folks. Uh, next slide. So the the regression of Alzheimer's disease the rate varies from person to person and over time. So we may see that people are, are having plateaus where they'll, they'll seem to level off for a period of time. Um, they may uh, have some ups and downs, um, but uh, overall, the, the, the direction of Alzheimer's disease is a progressive loss of skills. So it's a progressive, uh, progressive condition, even though that there may be plateaus at times, at least functionally. Um, presumably, the, the changes in the brain are, are an ongoing, uh, ongoing problem and not Having plateaus, but the uh, the symptomatically the, the functional changes may seem to plateau at times. There may also be at times where there are sudden changes where someone actually has a, a, a dramatic decline in skills, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, next slide. There's a number of reasons that may occur, and it may be uh, uh, from a stroke. Uh, we, we do know that atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, is less common in people with Down syndrome. But people with Down syndrome can get strokes from what are called embolic strokes, where there's um, a, a clot forms, particularly in the heart, and then it is thrown to the brain. And that seems to be more common in people that had uh, congenital heart disease. Um, and also we know that uh, with Alzheimer's disease, particularly in people with Down syndrome, even more than other people, there are, uh, as the plaque, as the amyloid, it's called, builds up, um, the, uh, that can, uh, 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 in a sense, damage or crush small blood vessels in the brain um, and, and cause, cause stroke. So that's a cause of, uh, one cause of a, a sudden change. Infection, a bladder infection, a pneumonia, even uh, skin infections and things can contribute to a sudden change in, in somebody. A depression, as I mentioned, can coexist or can be caused by Alzheimer's disease. So that if someone develops depression, that can uh, contribute to a sudden change. And again, all these things are, are potentially treatable uh, and, and again, uh, or, or you know, at least understandable and addressable. And so uh, if someone is having a change, you do want to take a look and see if there, if there, if there is something that's uh, reversible. So a new onset or change in metabolic condition like diabetes or hypothyroidism, uh, you want to take a look at look for and see if that contribute is contributing to the change. Uh, and a real big one is, uh, and a uh, relatively simple one is dehydration. Um, as people with Alzheimer's disease, uh, as it progresses, they will often drink less and less. And actually, I'm pretty convinced many, many people with Down syndrome already throughout their life don't, don't drink enough. Um, uh, but certainly it becomes more of an issue as, as people lose their thirst mechanism as the Alzheimer's disease progresses, uh, the lack of awareness of their own dehydration. And so that's something we really want to make sure that is getting addressed and, and uh, uh, helping people uh, stay as functional as possible, as long as possible. And then inadequate sleep is also another uh, cause for can be contributing to sudden changes. And that may be part of the Alzheimer's disease. That may be part of sleep apnea. That may be... Um, you know, related to environmental issues. So all those need to be looked at and see if there's a thing, something we can do to help improve the person's sleep and see if we can help improve their overall function. Again, maybe not being able to uh, specifically uh, treat the Alzheimer's disease, but we can treat these associated uh, conditions and, and help them help the person function better. And then pain is another one that's uh, uh, can cause a decline in skills. Many people with Down syndrome seem to have a higher pain tolerance so throughout their life. Um, and, uh, or some may actually just have more difficulty assessing pain or localizing pain. Um, but as people, with, uh, um, th there are some people with Down syndrome that actually uh, develop at some point a, a less pain tolerance and they're more susceptible to pain or experiencing pain. And we think one of those uh, conditions that in, at least in some of our patients that seems to contribute to to less tolerance of pain it is Alzheimer's disease in some of our patients. Uh, and so looking at that and, and, and looking to see, is there, is there some place that the, you know, that is, is there something that's causing the person discomfort? Is it arthritis or um, skin problems or, you know, many other causes that might contribute to somebody uh, having pain and you wanna make sure we're addressing those to, again, to optimize their function as long as possible. Uh, next slide. So, with all that said, um, I think that the key is that we really want to, uh, since, since there isn't a specific treatment for Alzheimer's disease at this point, we do really want to look at quality of life. And so 
we want to focus on doing what can still be done. We want to focus on friends and family and physical exercise and healthy eating, help people maintain their ideal body weight, uh, socially in, 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 encourage social engagements, create art, sensory stimulation. Uh, what I call the uh, bingo pace. Uh, we see that some of our folks as, as, they, as their Alzheimer's progresses, it's harder for them to keep up in, in the setting where they are and, and that becomes overwhelming. And so if they slow down a little bit and, and that's where the bingo comes in, you know, do things that we would tend to think of, um, you know, sometimes associated with older people without Down syndrome, uh, that's something that is, is more that their comfortable pace of life um, that actually helps them to function better. Uh, so they're not overwhelmed by trying to, to keep up with a, a pace that they're no longer capable. So uh, do any of these things prevent Alzheimer's disease? I mean, there's some suggestion that physical exercise might actually prevent Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think we'll know more over time, uh, but I think whether these things actually uh, do any preventing Alzheimer's disease certainly improves the quality of life uh, uh, for those individuals uh, as, the, they, as they're experiencing the, uh, uh, the progression, progression of loss due to Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. And I think this is you, Katie. Yeah, so now we are going to discuss how we can manage some aging, aging issues as well as Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to talk about them in um, as far as medicinal and non-medicinal strategies. So I'm going to first start with some non-medicinal strategies. And we're going to discuss a variety of environmental modifications, some adaptive equipment recommendations, our sensory system and how that can be impacted and some um, strategies we can use to address our sensory needs, visual supports, and the role of communication. So first we're gonna start with some home safety suggestions. And um, you can see in the top right picture, the difference between an all white bathroom versus a, a bathroom that has a pink toilet seat. And it's important to have contrasting colors in the bathroom, just because as we age, our sensory needs do change and we might have decreased vision. And just having that color contrast can make it easier for a person um, who is aging or who has Alzheimer's disease to be able to use the, the toilet more independently. You also wanna make sure that there's adequate lighting in rooms and hallways, and you wanna try to, to limit uh, shadows because that can be really distracting for someone with Alzheimer's disease. You also want to remove unnecessary furniture that uh, may get in the way so someone could trip or fall over the furniture um, or it could just impact their ability to maneuver through a room, um, especially with if um, the lighting isn't adequate. And then with mirrors, oftentimes it's important to remove mirrors altogether or to cover them because someone with Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome may see themselves in the mirror, but think that it's an intruder. And so it can increase anxiety. Um, it's really important to add handrails and ramps to stairs if, if needed. So we have a, a resource in the resource library for tips for going up and down stairs safely. One handrail is great, two is even better. And uh, when you think about ramps, especially if it's ramps outside into the home, every, uh, inch of height in a step is actually 12 inches of ramp. So that's really important to consider. Um, and that's why sometimes you see ramps that uh, seem really long, uh, but that curve through someone's you know, front or backyard. And then the last thing is to add reflective tape on stairs. So you want to provide contrast between the tread of the step as well as the riser, um, just to make sure that it's gonna be easier as far as their visual per perceptual skills to, to be able to go up and down steps safely. Some other things is that, you know, you want to ensure that chairs have armrests to help with sitting and standing. It just makes it a little bit easier. And to remove throw rugs and um, the, the sills in the doorway and, you know, um, that you might pass over. So if a rug cannot be fastened to the floor safely, it's just better not to have it at all because someone could trip and fall on it. Um, you know, we don't need to increase the risk of, you know, breaking a hip or, hip or fracturing their pelvis. You may also want to add a deadbolt out of reach or an alarm on main doors, especially if someone tends to elope. Um, you can add motion detectors in your house. Um, there are devices for those that wander, um, things like uh, the 
GPS uh, smart sole. So it's the sole of a shoe. You can just replace the regular sole of the shoe and then you can monitor where that person goes from a phone. Um, but there's also other GPS trackers that someone can wear um, so that you can monitor them if they do happen to elope from the home. You might wanna consider locking up medications and cleaning supplies just for safety and to remove locks on interior doors to prevent themselves, the person from locking themselves in, especially in like their bathroom or their bedroom. There's also some adaptive equipment that may be helpful. So weighted utensils are utensils that actually have some added weight to them. They help if someone um, has uh, maybe trouble holding on to a utensil. It's not always just the thick handled utensils, but it has some weight. So it provides proprioceptive input, which we'll talk about when we talk about sensory needs, because maybe they don't even feel the fork or the spoon in their hand. So if it's weighted, perhaps they feel it better and that will help with their, their self-feeding. It also helps if someone has tremors, maybe their medication has a side effect of hand tremors. And so having a weighted utensil can make it easier and safer and cleaner for them to continue to self-feed. You can also see there's a, a white plate and a blue plate. These are two different adapted plates. So the white one is just a divided plate. It helps so that food doesn't touch one another. Sometimes people have issues with that. And then the blue plate is an example of a scoop dish. So you can see that one side is elevated and that just makes it easier if you're going to load your fork or your spoon, you can scoop the food up through that and then it naturally will put it on the, the fork or spoon so that you can bring it to your mouth. And then in the top right uh, photo, seeing contrasting colors. So again, just like the bathroom, if you have white food on a white plate, they may not even realize that there's food there and they're not, you know, they think that they're finished eating. Um, and maybe that's why they haven't started to eat. But if you have contrasting colored plate to help with the food, especially if they happen to have a single color diet, that might just make it easier so that they can, can see um, the food on their plate. You may also need to consider adaptive equipment for the bathroom. So in the bottom right photo, there's actually a variety of adaptive equipment um, suggestions. You might need a shower chair, perhaps a handheld shower head. So we know that individuals as they age, um, their vision kind of gets smaller. And so when showers tend to be really hard for them because they feel like the water is coming out of nowhere. So oftentimes the handheld shower head makes that a little bit easier and can, can lessen the challenge of trying to have your loved one shower. Um, grab bars in the bathroom. So in the shower, you see that there are two white grab bars in there, but there are also rails around the toilet seat. You can also do a raised toilet seat. Although sometimes individuals with Down syndrome, because they're shorter in stature, maybe the raised seat's not as important, but having those handrails would be. For some people that have a tub in their home, and then it gets harder to, to step in and out of the tub. There is a piece of a, um, a different type of shower chair called a transfer tub bench. And so that is a wider tub bench where um, the bench fits inside the tub, but then it has an extender with two other legs that goes outside the tub so that you can then sit down outside the tub and swing your legs up and over into the tub um, in case having a shower stall is not feasible in your home. So those are our home safety and adaptive equipment recommendations. I'm gonna move into our sensory system. And when we think about our sensory system, I want you to think about it like electrical wiring. And here the wiring is intact and the light remains on. But when there's a kink in the wire, it may cause the lights to flicker. And sometimes we get a kink in our central nervous system and that leads to mixed messages to our sensory system. And many times we may not know what is causing the kink or how to stop our own internal lights from flickering. And when sensory processing is disorderly, the brain cannot do its most important job of organizing sensory messages. So when we see this kink, we may experience touch, taste, sound, smell, movement, and other sensations differently. Some may feel sensations more intensely while well, others feel them less so, and some just don't get the sensory information right. And this can impact our behavior. We may see verbal outbursts, physical aggression, 
slowing down or shutting down. And as we age, our sensory system may also experience sensations differently. For instance, naturally, there are changes with hearing, vision, and balance. And sensory input can actually help with feelings of anxiety, depression, as well as agitation. So here you see a handout that's available in our resource library on proprioceptive input. And proprioceptive input is input into our muscles and joints, and it's one of the first strategies used at the Adult Down Syndrome Center. Because individuals with Down Syndrome tend to have low muscle tone, and this can impact how they interpret sensory input coming in through their muscles and joints. Deep pressure input is supposed to have a calming and organizing effect on the sensory nervous system by lowering states of arousal, resulting in positive behavioral and emotional outcomes. So items on this resource list include things like everyday chores, vacuuming, wiping down counters, sorting laundry. It also includes joint compression, which we'll mention on the next slide, and other things like physical activity or vibration and weighted objects. So here's our handout on joint compression. And this can be used to help with transitions or if you see someone beginning to get worked up, you know, um, or you can also use these strategies to help calm someone down after they've had the tantrum or the meltdown. But what's great about joint compression is that it's like a mini massage and better yet, it doesn't require any equipment, just your two hands. And so if the person likes the feeling of joint compression, but doesn't want you to help them, they can complete push-ups against a wall or a table or a countertop and receive the similar effect of input into their joints. And then here you'll see a, a handout on affordable sensory equipment. And it's because if you were to look in a catalog, sensory equipment is really expensive. And I don't like families to rely on spending a lot of money especially because when it comes to sensory, it really is trial and error. I like to tell families that it's almost like you have a toolbox and sometimes you need the flathead screwdriver, sometimes you need um, the Phillips, you just don't know and that's how sensory is. One day one thing will work and maybe the next it won't. But here's a list of places you can get weighted blankets or lap pads, um, even places like Amazon, Bed Bath Beyond, Etsy, Walmart, all of those places are carrying weighted blankets now. You can do things like a weighted snake. They come in other animals as well um, that go along the shoulders or maybe they can um, rest on a lap. But oftentimes door stoppers that kept, keep the, um, the air out, the cold air out can you know, have a weight to them and they're a similar size as a weighted snake or even just neck wraps and warmers that you can find at Bed Bath & Beyond or Walgreens um, can, can be helpful. And then there's vibrating product, products. So, you know, handheld massagers are great. There's vibrating cushions that you can put in a chair. You can get a vibrating neck massager or even vibrating cushions or pillows um, that someone can then control the vibration, the input that they receive. However, it is really important to note something here about weighted products, especially weighted blankets. First off, it is recommended that a weighted product should be seven to 10% of a person's body weight and not more. However, it can be less if that works best. And many commercial weighted blankets actually advertise weights that are more than the recommended seven to 10%. Here you can see they're like 15 to 30% of someone's body weight. So please do not refer to their weight suggestions when choosing to purchase a weighted blanket. It's also highly not recommended to sleep under a weighted blanket, especially if there are concerns with seizures, asthma, sleep apnea, or cardiac issues. However, a weighted blanket can be used as part of a bedtime routine in order to calm before following, falling asleep, but it's really best if weighted products are used with supervision to ensure safety. So when it comes to our sensory system, Sometimes we need calming sensory strategies when we're worked up, and we may need alerting sensory strategies to help us if we're slowing down or we've shut down. So here is a, a list of different calming and alerting strategies that um, address a variety of the senses, you know, so the water temperature in a bath, 
you know, is more of a tactile or with the pets, things like that, um, where, you know, there's different physical activities that can be done. You know, you might have slow rhythmic music to help someone calm, but you might have more fast paced music for someone who um, needs a little bit more of alerting. I mean, it talks about the lighting in a room, how, you know, different things. Um, so I would like for you to refer to this if you think that your loved one may need to calm down or may need some alerting strategies. So with that, we're gonna move into the use of visual supports. And visual supports are pictures, words, or other images that are used to share or manage expectations, provide reminders, maintain skills and independence, and help communicate. Visual supports can also be used to provide or establish structure and routine, which we find is really important for individuals with Down syndrome always, but especially as they age. But the other thing about visual supports is they really can lessen the battle between the caregiver and the person with Down syndrome, and the visual support becomes the bad guy. Some of you may also say like, well, my, my loved one used visual supports when they were in school, but they haven't used them since, or my loved one thinks that they're childish. But really think about how you use the app icons on your smartphone or the grocery list you keep. Truly visual supports grow and change with all of us as we age. So here's an example of a first then board that can be used to help manage expectations. So typically the first is the non-preferred task and the then is the preferred task. So, you know, showering isn't always preferred. Maybe first shower, then they get to listen to music or play on their tablet. Um, or watch a movie, things like that. So first and then, very simple way to uh, help manage expectations. But here are some other examples of ways to share or manage expectations. You might have a weekly schedule or certain activities that have to be done on certain days. And so this schedule happens to be with Velcro, but it can be something that never changes and it can just be photos. Like I mentioned, sometimes bathing may not be a preferred task. And so you tell them that they have to take three showers a week, but then they get the choice and have some more control over which three days. So then for that week, you know, there's going to be Velcro. They pick Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so that when Monday comes along, you show them the visual and say, oh, it's Monday. You chose to take a shower today. And sometimes we just need to remind them or provide the, the, you know, the expectation, these are the things you need to do before you come downstairs or after breakfast or whatever it might be. So for this person, um, specifically, they had to get dressed, go to the bathroom, wash their face, brush their teeth, brush their hair, and then they were able to go downstairs and have breakfast. And then this last one is, um, more like a choice board. So we find that individuals with Down syndrome often forget that they have choices, that if they're not told to do something, they'd be just as happy sitting there doing nothing, or maybe just sitting there watching YouTube videos or you know watching a movie on repeat. So this would be a way to use a visual to say, what three things do you want to do today or this afternoon or in a certain time frame, whatever that might be. And then they can pick from their preferred list of of activities, and then that way they can see, oh, you know, when I'm done with the computer, I wanted to listen to music. So that's another way to share or manage expectations. Visual supports can also be used to provide reminders. So this is something we actually have um, a sample of in our resource library. We call it our orientation book. And so this is something that is really helpful as someone ages or they have Alzheimer's to remind them, like, this is where I eat and have a picture of your dining room or this is my room and have a picture of their bedroom. Um, you may also need to label certain rooms like this is their bathroom or this is their bedroom, um, just as a reminder. Sometimes using timers, whether it's a time timer like this one, the timer on the stove or oven or on your phone, um, especially if it's, we are leaving in 10 minutes. You know, when the timer goes off, it'll be time to go. Or you have this amount of time to do something and to set the timer. Perhaps it's reminding them how much water they need to drink for the day. So you want them to have six glasses of water. So when they drink a glass, they can add it with a check mark. Or perhaps it's they only get one soda. So you put that picture on the fridge, that reminder of one soda. And then when they've had that soda for the day, they don't get any more, but it's because you can bring them back to that picture to remind them they had their one soda. 
And then this is for someone who, you know, likes to call different family members, but, you know, wants to call every one of them every night. And so here's a schedule of when they get to call different family members. And then visual supports can be used to maintain skills and independence. And obviously, as someone with Down syndrome ages, this is something that we want to maintain as long as possible. But perhaps they need the reminder about the steps of how to use the restroom or the steps to make sure that they can bathe independently. Maybe it's the reminder that after they use the restroom, they wash their hands, they pull up their, you know, or they pull up their pants, wash their hands, and turn off the light, whatever it might be, in order to maintain skills and independence as long as possible. And then the final way visual supports can be used is to help facilitate communication. And so whether it's more like a communication device, but this is just a board with pictures on it that I want and they can pick things. It can be, you know, how they share their emotions, um, but there are also a variety of apps that can be used um, to create simple visual supports. But, you know, myself, other OTs, speech pathologists can also help families uh, create visual supports. And we also wanted to remind families of some additional communication strategies that can just make it a little bit easier when you're trying to speak to someone with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. You really want to provide simple instructions. Use as few words as possible, but that's also where the pictures and the visual supports can help, that you can just show them the picture and you don't even have to use words. We want to remind you not to argue. You're not going to win. Right, so don't even get into an argument with them because you're really just arguing with yourself. Avoid asking them if they remember, especially, you know, what's my name? Do you remember my name? Just walk in and say, hi, it's Katie. Always try to smile, right? That's just gonna make everything easier and it's gonna really make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Try not to raise your voice and really try to speak calmly with a slow pace. That's just gonna make it a little bit easier and again, keep their agitation level low, and really try to get down on their level. If you can look at them eye to eye and not just be towering over them, it's just gonna make communicating with them that much easier. So with that, I am gonna pass it back to Dr. Shacoin for some medicinal strategies. Uh, next slide, Katie. So as Katie's outlined a lot of uh, ways that we can help people with Alzheimer's disease, uh, that don't include medications. Um, and, and we really encourage to, to do those things first or, or in addition to any other uh, medicinal strategies that might be used. Um, <clears throat> but there are, as I mentioned before, there are some associated symptoms uh, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, and that may be depression, anxiety, agitation, or sleep challenges. And, and there are a variety of medications that can be used and, and, and what choice ends up being uh, selected or what medication ends up being selected is really influenced by the individual's particular symptoms and the particular effects and side effects of the medication. So for example, uh, for someone that uh, has depression along with Alzheimer's disease and is uh, losing weight and is not sleeping well, a uh, mirtazapine, which is an antidepressant that can be uh, used and, and often has a sedating uh, and an appetite stimulation effect to it. So that might be a good choice. And so there's lots of choices of, of, of these medications. And so which one gets ch chosen depends on the individual's particular symptoms. And, the, and again, the particular pattern of how the medication tends to affect people. Um, and then this is a real important uh, piece for, for families and, and uh, for individuals with Down syndrome that uh, can report observation report of their symptoms uh, are key to assisting with the medication selection. So looking for, you know, in the example I just gave, it is if the person uh, has symptoms of depression, but is having difficulty sleeping and is, is losing weight. Those would be particular additional his, history pieces that are uh, uh, important to share um, with, the, with your provider that uh, in, in helping him or her select a medication. Uh, next slide. And then specifically for treating Alzheimer's disease, um, there are, are two categories of medications, uh, uh, although a third, uh, third medication is, is close to apparently getting, a third category is close to getting uh, approved, I understand, uh, uh, but is not as yet to my knowledge. But anyway, these two categories are what are called cholinesterase, cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, one example is uh, uh, Aricept. Uh, and the other one, the other category, uh, and, and there's a several cholinesterase inhibitors in addition to Aricept. 
And then the other category is the NMDA receptor antagonist. There's only one, amemantine or namenda is the medication. Um, there was a, a large study, several, several, several studies done uh, for people with Down syndrome, with people with Down syndrome in, in uh, treating their Alzheimer's disease with these medications. And there really isn't good data that suggests that they work well. Uh, and that's been our experience as well. There's really is, is not data you know, that really supports their, their benefit or their use. Um, and uh, the other thing we find is that there's, we tend to see lots of side effects with these, uh, particularly with the colonesterase, colonesterase inhibitors. We often see uh, appetite suppression or weight loss. Uh, and with um, NMDA receptor, the, the memantine or the nemenda, uh, the most common um, uh, side effect we would see would be agitation. So um, again, no, no good data that shows that these are beneficial, significant potential for side effects, something to talk to your provider about uh, to see if, if uh, that's something that you would uh, uh, be interested in using uh, for the individual with Down syndrome or with Alzheimer's disease uh, in your life. Uh, next slide. And then Katie, I think you were gonna take it from there. I am, thank you. All right, so there are some lessons that we've learned from families and caregivers throughout the years. And one is this changing expectations. So we know that Alzheimer's affects the entire family. And oftentimes it's the elderly parents that are, that are caring for their, their child with Down syndrome, maybe initially, but they could be um, dealing with their own health and aging issues, which can make uh, caregiving challenging. They may also find it hard to let go of previous expectations that they've worked so hard and their, their loved one with Down syndrome has worked so hard to get to the point where they're getting, where they were independent and things, and they were, had this great quality of life. And then all of a sudden you start to watch that diminish and that can be really challenging. We also find that the role of grief is really, really hard. So families are grieving the change of, you know, in their loved one and the loss of skills. But then the caregiver themselves are also grieving. Um, perhaps they become more isolated. They don't get to go and see their friends as much, or they don't get to see their fam the rest of the family. They start to have more responsibilities and just all these changes in relationships can be a grieving process. Perhaps just accepting the diagnosis, and that's a process, and that's, you know, there's a, a um, period of grieving with that. But knowing that support from others can help. But it's important to, to realize when and how to ask for help with caregiving. You know, when does caregiving become too much? You know, when might the individual with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's perhaps need to move to a different living situation just because it's too hard? For the parents to continue to care. And um, knowing that there is support out there and that there's other families going through exactly what your family is going through and that they can share practical strategies, whether it's how to handle an eating or behavior issue or recognizing when that move is needed. But oftentimes what we also see is that the caregiver role shifts and it shifts from the, the parents to the siblings of the person with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. And the siblings face even different challenges. Perhaps they're, you know, they're part of the sandwich generation. So now they're caring for their elderly parents, they have their children, and then they have this sibling now with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's that they're helping support. You know, these siblings eventually may resume, assume full responsibility for uh, the sibling with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's, and then that can change the sibling relationship. So now they're not just sisters, but the sister is a caregiver and is more like a parent and that just it can impact the relationship. We've also learned that the siblings may not have all the tools they need in order to be 100% successful in the role. They might need to consider guardianship or changing guardianship if that hadn't you know, been um, addressed previously. They have to learn about the adult disability service system, maybe family estate arrangements and trusts and things like that. There's a lot that siblings need to learn and they don't always have those tools. The other, uh, the other struggle could be that there are multiple siblings. So while that could be great because there are more people to help provide that support, 
maybe not every sibling is um, in agreement with the, the, um, the treatment plan or the care plan or whatever decisions are being made. And then that can, that can be a struggle. So what's really important is to prepare for changes of roles if possible. So if you are an elderly parent and you know that um, a sibling is gonna be taking over at some point, then perhaps start preparing a little sooner than you originally had thought. And then it's really important to know that the caregivers need care of themselves and everyone needs help and support. So different sources of support are things like other family members, friends and neighbors, adult daycare programs, respite programs, home health agencies, and support groups. So we have a variety of resources available in our resource library, and I'm just gonna go through some of those and some other um, support options. You'll see at the top is a link for our general aging resources, and then I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. So one is the National Down Syndrome Society has created an aging and Down Syndrome health and well-being guidebook. And then the Canadian Down Syndrome Society has Today and Tomorrow, a guide to aging with Down Syndrome. So again, all of these are available on our resource library, or you can go to the individual um, sources and find them there as well. This was mentioned previously, but we have tips for going up and down stairs safely. And then our colleagues at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia have created this healthy aging toolkit, which is a series of links about different things like being active, eating well, um, staying connected and things like that. We also have a variety of resources specific to Alzheimer's disease. So again, this is the link for all of our resources and we're just gonna highlight a few. So the National Down Syndrome Society has a practical guidebook for caregivers when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. Dr. Shercoin has written a piece on seizures in people with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Um, as he mentioned that seizures are fairly common as um, someone ages and um, starts to uh, show signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, we also have uh, this video journal segment, which is wonderful. It features two sisters, one who has Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, and then her other sister who is her caregiver. And it really starts to follow their journey of what it was like after the diagnosis and living with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. It's really enlightening. It's very, very powerful. There are currently seven video segments and um, there will be a few more that will be added in the near future. And then the Down Syndrome Scotland has created uh, resources on let's talk about dementia and living with dementia. And these are really great. They provide some of those home safety recommendations, maybe equipment recommendations and just things like that um, that help the caregivers as well as the, um, the individual with Alzheimer's themselves. When it comes to other organizations and the resources they provide, the National Down Syndrome Congress has a list of local Down syndrome support groups so that you can check out that link. But then with the Alzheimer's Association, many local Alzheimer's Association chapters have been partnering with local Down syndrome organizations in order to provide resources. So you can reach out to the Alzheimer's Association or even to your local Down syndrome chapters to see if they have more information on this. There are also some options for online or phone support. So the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices has an online support group and we've provided the link there for more information. As well as um, in the Bay Area, there's the Down Syndrome and Dementia Family Caregiver Telephone Support Group, but they do invite individuals from all over to participate. So this is information on their support group, but you are welcome to contact Mary Ann for more specific information if that's gonna be helpful for you. And then there are two Facebook groups that we're aware of, um, the Down Syndrome and Alzheimer's Disease Support Group, which is moderated by the Down Syndrome Association of Wisconsin, as well as the Down Syndrome and Alzheimer's Down Syndrome Regression Support Group. Now these are private groups, so you do need to request to join the groups. I know specifically for the Down Syndrome and Alzheimer's Down Syndrome Regression Support, there are a series of questions that they want you to answer first before they, um, they allow you to join the group 
but those can be really helpful. Again, they're going to provide those practical strategies and suggestions. It's going to be the people that have lived through it or are currently living through it. And so it's a great place to reach out so that you can share your ideas and learn from one another. And then there are state services. So we really want to highlight that it varies from state to state. Um, but all states do offer services for adults with disabilities. So for instance, in Illinois, the, the services are housed under the Department of Human Services. But in the state of Wisconsin, they're managed by the Department of Health Services. So you really need to search your state government website to find the agency that's responsible. And again, we're just gonna share what's available in Illinois um, as an example, but then it gives you ideas of what you can find in your state. So in Illinois, there's two avenues for receiving services. There's the, um, the Department of Developmental Disabilities. So they're gonna provide services such as supports in the home, day programming, supported employment, and community living options. And then there's the Department of Rehabilitation Services. So these are services for individuals under the age of 60 and they do not necessarily, they do not have to have a developmental disability. This is for all individuals under the age of 60, but it's really designed for people who need help with the activities of daily living. Maybe they have more physical challenges that are impacting their ability to complete those, those ADLs. So um, this would provide services for support in the home, maybe respite care, nursing care, or some home modifications. And then there are also programs for adults with disabilities that, that, you know, they're primarily funded under Medicaid. So you need to make sure that your loved one has Medicaid. It's a federal program. However, each state runs their Medicaid program differently. Um, so there could be different Medicaid waivers, whether there's the home and community based services waiver or the community integrated living arrangement waiver. Um, Again, other states other than Illinois have this and states can customize Medicaid according to the needs of their state. Um, and again, it's just really important to make sure that your loved one is enrolled in Medicaid to even access these services. And then how the services are managed. So in Illinois, we use independent service coordination agency system to determine eligibility and then to connect individuals to services. So it's really important to find um, the, ser the, the organization that serves your area, but other states may have established a similar gatekeeper system. So it might not be an ind independent service coordination agency, but it's some other agency that acts as the gatekeeper. So it's really important to contact your state government to um, find out more about that. So with that, I think we're ready to open it up for questions, but just as a reminder, we have the link again for our resource library. For those of you who don't already follow us on Facebook, um, that you can um, access Facebook. We usually share one post a day, and then one time a month, we send out an email newsletter. newsletter. So if you haven't signed up for that, that's the link where you can enter your information. Thank you so much to Dr. Shacoin and Dr. Frank for sharing that information. We have received a couple questions and just as a reminder, you can use that Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen to submit any other questions. So the first question is, can hand tremors be a symptom of Alzheimer's disease? And um, if not, what else should that they be looking for that could be causing that? Yeah, we, we do see um, some Parkinson-like features, including tremors in some people with uh, Down syndrome who develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the other thing you'd certainly want to think about is, is whether the person does have Parkinson's and, and whether that would be you know, treatable uh, or whether the, the uh, tremor is significant enough that uh, without Parkinson's that, that would justify uh, a treatment as well. Um, again, with the recognition that uh, you know, all those medications would have the potential to uh, have side effects. And, and um, uh, if the tremor is not too bad, uh, you know, letting it go rather than, uh, and not treating it with medications rather than uh, the risk of side effects, but it really depends on how much of a challenge that the tremor is for individual, the individual. The other thing I should mention is that uh, one of the types of seizures or seizure-like activity that people get is called myoclonic jerking, which is, uh, uh, you know, kind of like just a one one 
jerk, sometimes repetitive, but oftentimes just one jerk can be the hands the, or the uh, upper extremities, the lower extremities, the trunk even. Um, and that's more like a, a, that's more in the seizure category. Uh, and again, um, if it's not really causing too much trouble, uh, sometimes we'll just let those, we'll just keep an eye on those and not treat them. Uh, again, because of the, the medications have the potential for uh, side effects, uh, including sedation and, uh, you know, confusion, uh, which uh, already are, can be significant problems in folks with Alzheimer's as it progresses. So again, trying to look to, to decide exactly what it is, tremor, seizures, or whatever, and then, and then deciding which uh, medication, if any, is appropriate. Thank you. Um, another question is, can you test for APP? Uh, it's not uh, it's not clinically something, testing for APP is not something clinically we do. Um, you know, there are certainly uh, ways to look at that uh, from a research standpoint uh, and perhaps even a genetic uh, counseling standpoint, but it's not something that we would typically do. So I'm not actually 100% sure on the answer to that one. Thank you. Um, we are receiving several more questions and if we don't get to all of them, we will continue to share information on our resource library. So please do look there for additional information. What is the average time between caregivers seeing something wrong or different and the diagnosis? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think it depends on, on uh, you know, how long before you, the individual is brought to a provider, how perhaps how um, uh, familiar the provider is with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, so I think that's a pretty varied, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, you know, some of the symptoms can be subtle. Uh, and so it, it may be that uh, um, early on, it's not clear that this is the onset of Alzheimer's disease. For example, it may, you know, it may just look like depression. Um, and um, uh, you know, that may actually be the early symptom of Alzheimer's disease and, and it's uh, treated as depression only, which really is, is what you would do. There's really not anything you would do differently at this point. Um, so it, it really is pretty variable. Uh, and then the other issue is, is from the onset of symptoms, you know, how long, how long, does, how long does it last? And, and that's also very varied. And, and again, as we, as we see now that, uh, you know, some people are probably having subtle symptoms earlier on that we may not have appreciated before as, as the uh, onset of Alzheimer's in the past, um, that uh, we, we now are seeing people, you know, live, uh, certainly it, it tends to be more rapid decline in people with Down syndrome with Alzheimer's than it does in others with Alzheimer's, but we have seen, you know, people live many years, even you know, 10, 10, more, 10 and more years uh, from the onset uh, of symptoms to, to their passing. So uh, lots of variability in all, all of that. Thank you. We have received some questions about the impact of COVID-19 on individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Um, some of them are about, are you seeing an increased amount of confusion or cognitive decline because of it? We also, um, someone made the point that COVID may have impacted the ability to exercise. So do you anticipate that that could contribute to faster Alzheimer's advancement? Those are all great questions for which we don't really have an answer at this point. We, we do know from the, uh, the large international study that, that came out uh, last week or so uh, with over a thousand uh, individuals with Down syndrome uh, with COVID, uh, we do know that dementia or Alzheimer's is a risk factor for uh, complications of uh, um, COVID. Uh, but beyond the other questions with regards to, uh, you know, do we see more confusion? You would think probably there will be some because, um, you know, COVID is, uh, can affect can affect the brain, and, and we do see that uh, if you look in that study, one of the one of the uh, symptoms that's a little different in people with Down syndrome and COVID is that confusion tends to be more of a symptom of uh, uh, COVID than in, in other people, um, and so uh, that was not specifically um, separated out for those with and without Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, but that is a you know that is a finding. So I would not be surprised if that's the case for people with Alzheimer's. Uh, and as far as the reduced exercise. Um, you know, how, how all the changes uh, in people's schedules and their activities and all that, how that will ultimately affect uh, their cognition and, and down the road, potentially Alzheimer's disease is, is unknown, but um, at least on the short term, it does seem to have some impact on individuals uh, with uh, 
regards to um, their function and, and, and trying to optimize their function in, in, in the light of uh, um, these restrictions, and including the, the things that uh, Katie and Laura are doing with groups and Zoom and, and whatnot, uh, is, is very important. And I don't know if you want to talk to any more about that, Katie, or... No, but in, I think it was in May, Dr. Shacoin and I did another webinar that should be available in our resource library about um, some of the changes that we might be seeing because of COVID and we provided some recommendations um, in that presentation. So that would be a good place to look. Yes, and I, earlier we showed the, the screenshot of our resource library and how you can select a particular topic. We have added a COVID-19 topic and we have a number of resources related to COVID-19 there, including ideas for how to stay active and engaged. Um, this question says, my daughter recently received a diagnosis of early dementia, MRI. She is 43 with Down syndrome. She lives in a group home. Will the diagnosis progress to Alzheimer's? Can you read that question one more time, Laura? My daughter recently received a diagnosis of early dementia, and in parentheses it says MRI. She is 43 with Down syndrome. She lives in a group home. Will the diagnosis progress to Alzheimer's? So there, in, in, the, in the population of people without Down syndrome uh, who develop uh, some memory impairment associated with aging, um, you know, a certain number of them certainly will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease, but not all of them. Uh, I am unaware of any data uh, that would indicate uh, that we really know the answer to that question in people without Down syndrome or people with Down syndrome. I think that we, uh, um, you know, the ability to, to diagnose and, and, and clearly show memory impairment uh, consistent with the, the, you know, the early memory changes uh, without Alzheimer's disease, I, th I think is less clear in people with Down syndrome uh, anyway. So I think that's a challenge. I, I, I would say that um, uh, a, sign a very significantly a uh, large number of our individuals that develop memory impairment later in life do go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but again, I think the key is, is, uh, is looking for other potential causes and making sure those are being addressed. Thank you. What types of psychological changes present? So, you know, really it's a, it's a, a wide variety. So, um, if, uh, for example, uh, years ago, Dr. McGuire, our former social worker, uh, described uh, that people with Down syndrome often have what he, he called the groove, which is a tendency towards sameness or repetition. Uh, and, and so that's a very functional thing for many people as they go through life. You know, they have their routines and, and it helps them function well and get through their day well. Uh, and um, so we see as, as people uh, develop uh, Alzheimer's disease, sometimes we'll see uh, those, they lose those grooves and that can be kind of an early sign for some people. And, and some people actually then go the other direction, those grooves sort of, it's like grooves on steroids, you know, they're, they're, they have very severe grooves uh, and, it, and it becomes very dysfunctional. Um, and, and so that would be one example, certainly depression's an example, anxiety, agitated behavior, um, you know, sleep disturbances, uh, all, all those things, uh, unfortunately can be uh, associated with uh, psychological symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease and more and more. Thank you. Uh, do, do myoclonic jerks damage the brain if not treated? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Not that we know of. Uh, and, um, and again, uh, certainly if they're impairing somebody's function, you know, if, the, if their hand is jerking uh, so much that they can't feed themselves or if their, their trunk is jerking that it's knocking them down, uh, that, that would clearly be something that we would, we would treat. Um, in those that just have a, a, a rare uh, myoclonic jerk, um, um, it, you know, we often find that the medication actually causes more trouble than the, the myoclonic jerking. So it really is it's very individual in the approach. But the answer to the question is, I am not aware of any uh, literature that indicates that uh, untreated myoclonic jerking causes further brain damage. Thank you. This next question um, says, with no known deterioration of the oral muscular system, 
can a deterioration in the clarity of speech be associated with cognitive impairment associated with Alzheimer's? Uh, well, I'm not a speech therapist, so I will uh, uh, say my answer would have to be definitely prefaced by that. Um, I, I would think, uh, you know, based on what I've seen, um, yeah, the answer would be yes. I mean, we certainly see people, uh, their speech and their, their ability to communicate declines uh, even when they're, they don't seem to have any uh, dysarthry or difficulty with uh, enunciating and things like that or oral motor changes uh, at that point. So I, I, uh, if I understand the question correctly, which I'm not being a speech therapist, I may not be truly understanding the question, but my, my sense of that would be yes. Thank you. Is there a promising treatment on the horizon for Alzheimer's disease? Well, uh, I think Katie pointed out a lot of things that help people do better uh, and function better. And, and so I would say there's lots of things already here, uh, but that's probably not really what you're asking. I think you're asking, is there, is there a medication or something to cure Alzheimer's? Uh, and there isn't at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on this, uh, both with and without people with Down syndrome. Um, and, and, you know, I think just each day, and I, like I said, mentioned earlier, I did read that there's a, a, a glance at it, I didn't have a real chance to read it thoroughly, that there's something coming down the pipe that's, uh, uh, you know, a different category than what we have, um, the two categories we have. So uh, all the time there's new things being looked at. Um, you know, I, I, I say that uh, like Edison uh, and his 99 light bulb failures, uh, it really wasn't, the focus wasn't on those 999, it was on the one that worked. So um, lots of things are being looked at and hopefully one of those is gonna pop up soon for, as being the thing that, uh, you know, one of the things that'll really help people. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few minutes left if there are any final questions. Um, and someone replied, thank you. You did understand my question referring to the speech, the speech question. So thank you for that answer. Um, There's hope so, for me. <laughs> <laughs> so any final thoughts you um, can submit? And I'll also turn it back over to Dr. Shapoyan and Dr. Frank if, if they have any final comments they'd like to make. Katie? I just think that, you know, as Dr. Chapoin mentioned, there are a lot of strategies available to support not only the loved one with Down syndrome, but also the families in order to make um, this challenging situation maybe less of a challenge. And so if you don't have the supports um, available close to you, hopefully you can locate some resources or supports based on the information we shared today. We are always available. You can contact us on our website if you have any questions and I can have Laura exactly tell you how to do that. Um, and we will be happy to create resources for you um, and share more information so that the information's out there for everyone to access. And I would just add to that is that, you know, you know there, there may not be something that we can do to, to cure it or to fix it per se, uh, but there is, it's never hopeless from the standpoint, there's not something we can do to help people and, and that you can do to help uh, your loved ones. So there's lots of things that we can do to help people function better longer, uh, to enjoy life more and to be more comfortable uh, as unfortunately as the disease progresses as of what we have today. But uh, there are things that we can do to help people uh, do better um, even if we can't cure it at this point. Thank you. And we did receive a few more questions. Um, so I will go ahead and share those. Is there anything specific we can be doing with our 21 year old as far as prevention? Well, I, I mean, I will start with the, the things that we know, uh, I think, um, you know, with regards to uh, exercise in the, in the non-Down syndrome population that seeming to be one thing that we um, uh, can uh, do to, that may actually help prevent or delay Alzheimer's disease uh, for us as we get older. Is it, it certainly exercise is a big one. Um, I, I think the other thing that the, the data isn't quite as clear, but I, I think the other things with regards to uh, cognitive stimulation, 
participating in activities, uh, social interaction. Uh, you know, those are certainly things that, you know, I think are important. Uh, and Katie can talk about that more. Uh, and but the other thing I think other risk factors for Alzheimer's but maybe associated with Alzheimer's disease, sleep apnea, uh, you know, looking at that and, and diagnosed, getting that diagnosed uh, if uh, if uh, that's, uh, you know, a, a, a problem and getting that treated, uh, optimizing health in every other way. Um, you know, there's some suggestion that uh, obesity may be uh, a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, encouraging people to uh, uh, be closer to their ideal body weight. Um, there's some suggestion that uh, glucose intolerance uh, can be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, again, not hard and fast data, but I think, you know, these are all things we want to be doing for our health anyway, you know, maintain our ideal body weight, regularly exercise, um, you know, limit our sugar, limit our, uh, you know, simple carbohydrates, uh, you know, focus more on whole grains and things like that. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so all these things, uh, good night's sleep, um, you know, all the things that Katie talked about, um, you know, again, we don't have real solid evidence that those prevent Alzheimer's disease, uh, but there's solid evidence that they have other benefits and, and there may be the additional benefit that down the road they may prevent Alzheimer's disease. So I, I would encourage you to continue all those efforts that you do to, to stay healthy. Thank you. Um, and this last question is, what are the side effects of COVID in a person with Down syndrome? So the, the symptoms um, uh, of COVID are, are similar to, to uh, uh, the rest of us, uh, and um, except the one additional thing is, is confusion or, or you know, change in mentation tends to be more common in people with Down syndrome than it would in somebody else. And, and that's based on the the, the study I talked about, the, the thousand plus people with uh, Down syndrome and COVID, the international study that uh, came out a week or so ago. I, I think we have that on our webpage. Do we not, Laura, the link to that? I, um, not the newest study, but okay. I can get that up this week. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, and thank you all so much for joining today. As a reminder, this webinar was being recorded and we will share the recording on our resource library and Facebook page within two weeks. And we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you.